Nobody in the Bible who is resurrected ever makes a single comment about knowing or experiencing anything while dead. So the idea that people die and go right to heaven and get immortality before the resurrection is not what the Bible teaches. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. How many of you will admit that you've walked through a graveyard before and read some of the tombstones? Might not have even been a funeral. And uh, you can learn a lot by doing that. You know, even Solomon said, uh, better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting, for the living will take it to heart, for that is the end of all men, Ecclesiastes 7. In other words, we all know that our lives eventually will be summed up by a dash between two dates. And it's important for us to realize what do we do with our lives and what happens when they end. Is that it? It's something that we ought to understand, and the Bible actually addresses it. And so in our presentation tonight, we're going to be talking about bewitching spirits. You'll be surprised that um, prophecy does address this subject, and we need to be aware of what the Bible says. And it tells a story about uh, King Saul. The Bible tells us that there was a war between the Philistines and the Israelites, and in desperation because they were greatly outnumbered, King Saul tried to get the prophets to talk to him. There was no guidance from God. God was silent because Saul had continued to reject God. He killed the priests of God. He was trying to kill King David, the anointed of God. And now in a battle, he thought at the last minute he could pray, God wouldn't speak to him. So in desperation, Saul said to his attendants, I need some advice. Find one of the local witches. And they said, well, king, you know, that's illegal according to the word of God, but uh, we do happen to know there's a witch here in Endor. He said, I need to talk to her. I need some message. Maybe if, if she could conjure up the spirit of Samuel the prophet and tell me what I'm supposed to do. So he did that. And he went to the witch, and she went through her incantations and <laughs> threw some gunpowder on the fire, and smoke came up, and she cried out. And he said, what do you see? Oh, I see an old man. And all of a sudden, she gave this very discouraging message that ostensibly was from Samuel the prophet that she claimed to have power to call up from the dead. And he, the prophet actually, this apparition or this spirit, gave some truth, and he mixed it with some air, but gave an utterly discouraging message to King Saul and basically said, why did you call me up? Tomorrow you're going to be with me because you've rejected God, and you and your sons are going to die in the battle tomorrow. And Saul fainted from discouragement. Sure enough, the next day when he went into battle, they lost the battle. They were soundly defeated. And you ever heard the expression that a person falls on their sword? That's what happened to King Saul. Now here's the question. Was it God that gave him that message? Was that coming from Samuel the prophet? Does a witch of the devil have the power to resurrect a prophet of God? We need to know what the Bible says about the subject of death. Question number one. Was this form that Saul saw actually Samuel the prophet? Are all messages from the spirit world true? Or does the devil have fallen angels that can masquerade as the dead if he wants? Told you it's also a prophecy study. Revelation 16, 14. For they are the what? The spirits of devils doing what? Working miracles. Or if we stop right there, you've got the whole point. The devil has fallen angels that can work miracles, and it says the beast's power will go so far in the last days as to even bring fire down from heaven to deceive people. So we need to know, are these dead people, or are they fallen angels that are supposedly appearing to everybody in the last days? What does the Bible say about death? Question number two. Do dead people come back to converse with or to haunt the living? All right, we've got a number of scriptures for you. Job 14, 21. Speaking of a person that dies, Job says, 
His sons come to honor, and he knoweth it not. They are brought low, he perceives it not of them. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, 6, and verse 10. This is written by Solomon. The dead know not anything, neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. And it goes on to say, neither have they any more a portion forever in anything done under the sun, meaning in this life. The dead are not coming back and forth from heaven to earth. It says, there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. There's no knowledge, no wisdom. Nothing's happening in the grave. See, death, the Bible says, is a dreamless sleep with no consciousness of time. Now, the reason this is important is because some people, they won't believe the Bible, but if a spirit of the dead comes and talk to them, ooh, that'd be very important. According to the book of Revelation, who has the keys of death and the grave? Who's the one that can answer these questions that we're wondering about? Revelation 1.18 says, speaking of Jesus, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore and have the keys of hell. That word hell there means the grave and death. And so Jesus is the one who can answer these questions about death for us. There's a lot, not only in the Old Testament, there's a lot in the New Testament that'll make this subject, I think, very clear. All right, question number four. To understand what happens when you die, it's probably a good idea to understand how did God make man in the beginning? You go to Genesis chapter two, and it gives you the answer. And the Lord God, what? He formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed in him the breath of life, and man did what? He became a living soul. And there's something special about the breath of God's life because it took what was nothing more than clay and revived it and gave it vitality. You've probably been to a funeral before, and most of you have at some time done a viewing. You've seen a dead body in the casket. I know it's not pleasant. And uh, you know that there's something very important missing. They may be all intact there, but there's no life, there's no consciousness, they're dead. They don't have that breath of life. You notice it doesn't say God gave man a soul. When you combine the spirit of life with the elements of earth, he became a soul. The two together create a soul. A soul, it doesn't say God put a little soul in man. He put the breath of life in man. When you have the elements of earth that are in the human body, and you got the breath of life, you put them together, he became a soul. When you die, what happens? It's sort of like creation in reverse, and that's question number five. At death, what is it that happens then? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and it goes on to say, the spirit returns to God who gave it. Now, there you have it, Pastor Doug. The spirit returns to God. Well, that word spirit there is the word in Hebrew, it's roach, and it simply means the breath returns to God. It doesn't mean there's this little ethereal ghost that jumps out of a person when he dies and flies off consciously to God. It's simply saying the power of life returns to God who gave it. Because in the Bible, it also says that any creature that dies, the spirit returns to God who gave it. It's talking about the spirit of life in all of God's creatures. You know, everything breathes. Worms breathe, fish breathe, plants breathe. It's this breath of life that God gives us creatures. Let me give you some more proof for that. You look, for instance, in Job 27, verse 3. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. What's Job talking about the Spirit here? It's the same word. It's breath. All the while the breath is in me, and the wind of God is what he's saying is in my nostrils. That's all that means. Um, now, what about people, Pastor Doug? They die on an operating table. Maybe they, during heart surgery, there's a car accident or something, and they said, I came back, and I was being caught up, and I hovered around. I could hear the doctors talking, and, or I had this experience where angels spoke to me, and God spoke to me, or I went to heaven, and I got a glimpse of heaven, or some have di died, and they've had these OBEs. They're called out-of-body experiences. And they say, I, I was down in the grave, 
and I was in hell and I heard people shrieking and I saw my old boss there and, <laughs> and they, they have all these experiences and they write books and they sell like crazy. And there are people who are basing the, their theology about death on these visions that people have when they're in the operating room and they die. Is that safe? You know, what's interesting, it doesn't matter what country you go to. If you go to India where you have principally Hindu people, they have near-death experiences when they die or almost die. You know, they don't usually die. Their heart stops beating. The oxygen is robbed from their brain and they hallucinate. April 7, 2010, near-death experiences, sometimes known as NDEs, are reported between 11 and 23% of survivors of heart attacks, according to previous research. Researchers in Slovenia reporting on Thursday in a peer-reviewed journal, this is a medical uh, evaluation they did called Critical Care, investigated 52 consecutive cases of heart attack in three large hospitals. The patient's average age was 53, 42 of them were men, 11 patients out of that group had near-death experiences, but there was no common link between these in terms of what their age was, their sex, education, religious beliefs, fear of death. What they found was the common association was high levels of CO2 in the blood and a lesser degree of potassium. When your blood is robbed of oxygen, you will hallucinate. Now, the thing is that in India, when they have a near-death experience, they don't go to heaven. They are reincarnated. Uh, when you go to other religions of the world, they don't have Christian hallucinations. Your hallucinations that you have in a near-death experience are going to be based upon your experience. And so, oh, but Pastor Doug, it was so real. I'm not denying that God may have spoken to you in a dream. God might speak to you in a near-death experience. The question is, do we build our theology about what truth is based on a person's experience or dream when their heart stops beating on an operating table. Is that the criteria that God wants us to use for things like that? Question number six. Where do the dead go when they die according to the Bible? You read in Job 21 verse 32, yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. Where do they go? They're brought to the grave, we knew that, and they remain till when? till the resurrection. Listen to what Jesus said. John 5, 28 and 29, all that are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. Now that to me is what they used to call a slam dunk scripture. That means that's really hard to argue with. Jesus said when he comes, there'll be a trump, there'll be the shout of the archangel, the voice of the Lord, and all that are where? In their graves. They hear from their graves. They hear, and they'll come forth. So where are they when he comes? Are they floating around in heaven? Are they in purgatory? Are they in limbo? Are they in Abraham's bosom? Look at all these ideas. Are they in some transcendental state waiting to be reincarnated? No, Jesus said, they're in their graves. The Bible makes it plain that King David will be saved. We all agree? This is a good King David, killed Goliath, man after God's own heart. Is he in heaven now? No. no. This is from the New Testament. Peter says, Acts chapter 2, and keep in mind, this is after the resurrection of Jesus. David's still not in heaven yet. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you regarding the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day, his tomb. Keep reading. He says, for David, verse 34, for David is not ascended into the heavens. Now, somebody say amen if that's clear. Amen. David's going to be saved. Is he there yet? No. Now, is anybody in heaven now? Yeah, there are some. Mark chapter 9, verse 1 through 8, two individuals appear to Jesus um, on the Mount of Transfiguration. Who were they? No. Moses and Elijah. Are they in heaven? The Bible tells us how they got there. There are exceptions. Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot in 2 Kings chapter 2. You can read about that. Then you can read regarding Moses in the book of Jude, verse 9. It says, Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Michael came to resurrect 
Moses. And the devil said, you can't have him. And Michael said, the Lord rebuke thee. And Moses received a special resurrection. It's not in the Bible. The Jewish tradition says it was three days later. Then there were some others around the time of Christ's crucifixion. You can read about this in Matthew 27, verse 52. When Jesus died, it says there was a great earthquake and the graves were opened and many, not all, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, this is a local resurrection around Jerusalem, were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many. So a number of the patriarchs and prophets and saints that had lived and worked among God's people that were buried around there as a trophy, the first fruits, the Lord raised some of them. Maybe like Isaiah the prophet, I think he was in that group, who had foretold the coming of the Messiah, who died at the hands of King Manasseh. He was martyred for his faith. I think the Lord brought him forth and, and maybe many others, maybe Jeremiah the prophet, and, and he took them on to heaven with him. So some are there. But the general resurrection of the dead has not happened yet. That's still in the future. Number eight, but isn't it true that the soul is immortal and that only the body dies? Can you show me a verse in the Bible that says we have an immortal soul? How many of you have heard people talk about our immortal souls? In spite of the fact there is no verse, we always hear about it. People sing about it, they preach about it. But you know what the Bible says about immortality? You read in Ezekiel 18, verse 4, you know what immortal means, it means you can't die. The soul that sins, it shall what? It'll die. This is like a dictionary definition. What is the penalty for sin? You see, this is the first lie that the devil told Adam and Eve. God said, if you disobey, you'll die. And the devil said, don't listen to him. You don't really die. You will not surely die. Sad thing is there are even some Christian pastors that are preaching what the devil said in the garden. God said, you sin, you die. 1 Timothy 6.15, here's one from the New Testament. There's many more. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only has immortality. We don't have immortality. It's a gift for the righteous. So the idea that people die and go right to heaven and get immortality before the resurrection is not what the Bible teaches. 1 Corinthians 15.51, we shall all be changed. When does this happen? In a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and this mortal will put on immortality. That's when it happens, when the Lord comes. Amen? That's what the Bible teaches. If we were going to be Bible Christians, let's just make sure we're straight on that. Number 10, how does the Bible repeatedly refer to death? Jesus, speaking of his friend Lazarus that died, he said, our friend Lazarus, what? Sleep. He sleeps. And then they said, oh, good, Lord, he was sick. If he sleeps, he'll start getting better. Jesus, no, he sleeps. <laughs> he said, Lazarus is dead. That's what Jesus said. What word did Jesus use to describe death? Sleep. And they said, oh, Lord, he's, he'll get better. He said, he's dead. And then Jesus comes to raise Lazarus. He's been dead four days when he finally gets down to Bethany where he had died. Jesus got the news. He was up in Galilee. And it says, when Jesus said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, his bound hand and foot with the grave clothes. He came back to life by the word of God. Now, this is one of the things I, I just don't want you to miss. There are approximately, I'm just doing this in the top of my head, uh, a dozen resurrections in the Bible. Nobody in the Bible who is resurrected ever makes a single comment about knowing or experiencing anything while dead. Shouldn't that tell us something? There's total silence. Why? Because they were dead and unconscious. Why does Satan want us to believe that the spirits of the dead are really alive? Answer? It says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24 and 25, Jesus said, for there will arise false Christs and false prophets and they will show not just any kind of sign but great signs and wonders. How convincing are they? 
in so much that if it were possible, they will deceive the very elect. That's why we're doing this study, friends. What's going to prevent us from being deceived? According to the law and the prophets, according to the word of God, if they don't speak according to this word, there's no light in them. If you see apparitions, if you get feelings, it doesn't mean that this is a message from God. By the way, what I'm telling you right now, this is not some new unique theology. If you're a Protestant, this is what Martin Luther believed. If you like the English translation of the Bible, the guy who translated William Tyndale, this is what he believed. This used to be what all Christians believed. That's why the old cemetery said RIP, rest in peace. But the more popular version of people going right to the rewards before the judgment and before the resurrection has sort of eclipsed what the Bible actually teaches about death. And you know what? The devil is exploiting that today and the media is filled with it. And he's got all of his angels, his fallen angels. And their Bible says man is made lower than the angels. They're very clever. They know what your grandma sounded like. They know what she looked like. They know what she smelled like. They know their little nuances. They know little secrets in the family. Nobody else would know because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but there are spiritual forces that are around us. There's a whole spirit world that we don't know anything about. Revelation 18, verse 23. This is kind of frightening. By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. How many nations? All. When Saul decided to see a witch, did that end well for him? We've got to stay away from these things that God condemns. Revelation 18, verse 2, Babylon the great is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. So is it clear in Revelation that there are spiritual powers, that they work miracles, that they deceive the nations, and we don't want to be among that group. And God brought you, you've tuned in, because he wants you to be aware of what the Bible really teaches. The reason this is important is because there are many Christians that don't understand these things. And it does matter. All right, 1 Timothy. Apostle Paul tells us here in verse 1, in the last days he said, some shall depart from the faith. And what happens when they depart? Giving heed, listening to, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There are diabolical doctrines out there that have found their way into the church connected with what happens when a person dies? In Ephesians 5, verse 11, <clears throat> there he says, Have what? No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. God doesn't want us to be involved in these things. Don't even go to those places. Number 15, and this is our last question. What glorious power does God offer his people? I don't have to be afraid of death. Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Now I think we all know that from the cradle we are on a conveyor belt that we cannot stop. We age. I'm reminded every year. I do all I can to prolong my life but I know even with my best efforts that ultimately it'll catch up with us. What I'd like to do is die like Moses. He was 120, he climbed a mountain, he felt great, and then he died. <laughs> that's, that's the way to do it. But do we need to be afraid of death? The Bible says, he that has the Son has life. He that has not the Son has not life. You can have eternal life. You, I've got good news for you. Listen carefully. Christians do not die. You might say, Pastor Doug, wait a second. Christians don't die. When Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned, it says he went to sleep. Christians go to sleep. We don't have to be afraid of death any more than we have to be afraid of going to sleep. Matter of fact, if you're a believer, you can actually be excited about it because if you sleep the sleep of death, your next conscious thought is a glorified body and the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. But that'll happen because you have a trusting relationship with Jesus. Do you know him? And he wants you to know the power of his resurrection. You can make a decision tonight to say, you want to have that relationship with Jesus.
You don't want to miss this week's incredible free offer. The Landmarks of Prophecy Bible Study Set, featuring 21 individual study guides that accompany each week's program. Take advantage of this free offer today and use these lessons during each broadcast. Simply text your name and address to 0458-222-444 or visit amazingfacts.com.au to order online. For today's free offer, just text your name and address to 0458-222-444 or visit amazingfacts.com.au to order online. Throughout recorded history, tales of ghosts and spirits can be found in folklore in nearly every country and culture. Egyptians built pyramids to help guide the spirits of their leaders. Rome sanctioned holidays to honor and appease the spirits of their dead. Even the Bible tells of a king that used a witch to contact the spirit of a deceased prophet. Today, ancient folklore of spirits and apparitions have gone from mere superstitions to mainstream entertainment and reality. Scientific organizations investigate stories of hauntings and sightings, trying to prove once and for all the existence of ghosts. Even with all the newfound technology and centuries of stories all over the world, there is still no clear-cut answer. So how do we know what's true? Why do these stories persist? Does it even matter? We invite you to look inside and find out for yourself. Visit ghosttruth.com. Are you wondering what lies ahead in human history? Landmarks of Prophecy offers clear answers to your most pressing questions. Presented by Pastor Doug Batchelor, Landmarks of Prophecy is a video Bible study adventure designed for today's audiences, presenting the landmark themes of the Bible in a compelling way, giving you knowledge to face the future with confidence. Start your epic Bible study adventure with Landmarks of Prophecy today by calling 07-5577-1041 or by visiting amazingfacts.com.au.